Welcome to the Crimson Engine, my name is Rubidium. Today we are breaking down day three of the feature film Devil's Fortune. On day three we had two locations, my backyard and some steps. The first one went really well, the second one let's just say it was a challenge. So the first scene on this day, which was a Wednesday, was the second part of a cafe scene. There is a cafe scene in the film where the lead character goes to get information and things are not going wrong. He gets drugged and gets captured by the bad guys. Now, cafes are difficult to shoot in for lots of reasons. One, it's difficult to find one that will let you shoot there um, when it's closed. So you usually have to shoot around some of the things that are already happening. They are loud because uh, espresso machines make a lot of noise. They are typically not the most gigantic, well-dressed, well-lit areas. So you end up getting what you get. So when I was planning this film, I decided I would split up the cafe scene. One scene where the guy gets his coffee and meets the barista, and the second scene where he goes to a courtyard or like the kind of break area of the cafe where he actually gets to have a conversation. And that's when uh, the drug starts taking its effect and he actually passes out. So this was less a cafe scene than a courtyard scene but we didn't actually have a courtyard to shoot in. We had my backyard. If you look at some of the references that I got for this, namely the one in The Dragon Tattoo, David Fincher's remake, it was a courtyard in a private garden in London. And because you want the key to be upstage, meaning you want it to be on the far side of the 180 degree rule, typically what you would do is get an establishing shot of the two people talking and then cross the line and put the camera on the dark side, the outer side of the courtyard and shoot back into the courtyard so that the side facing away from the camera is bright and you get that um, nice cinematic far side lighting. We couldn't do this because if we placed the camera on the tree side and looked in, we would have got uh, all the domestic stuff like houses and fences and mailboxes. And it would, have, uh, it would have messed up the illusion that we're in a kind of courtyard cafe. So we had to shoot into the fence, which was fine because there are a couple of beautiful big orange trees that kind of give some interest. And I was kind of tapping into that godfather idea that every time you see oranges, someone's about to die. That is actually a real thing, look it up. So what we had to do is boom lights over the talent in between the talent and the fence, the orange trees, to try and get uh, light coming from that side. We were helped by this fact that we chose to shoot this early in the morning where the light was coming through the trees. But to get a little bit more contrast, uh, we had to use a Hudson Spider, um, totally raw, like we didn't put diffusion or anything on it, we just let the shape of the, the limbs of the light um, sort of stand in for light filtering through the leaves. Put up a big black flat uh, next to camera to bring down the contrast ratio and darken the, the camera side of the actors' faces. This worked a lot better in the singles than it did in the wide, because if we'd had it too close to the actors in the wide, you would have seen it, it would have been in the shot. But an added problem is the longer we went, the higher the sun came up and the more washed out the contrast ratios got. I have been able to do quite a lot with this shot in post by sort of masking the good side of the face, bringing that up, taking down the other side of the face and the background. Once again, we used the Pro Aim slider to do a slow push in the wide for added interest. Also, we used it on the singles to push in slowly and kind of create interest uh, by giving a moving background and coming more to the character's eyeline as the scene went on. The background of Greg's character, Pascal, uh, was super interesting. I liked it. You got to see the side of the house and all kinds of interesting branches and trees. But when we turned around to see Connor's side, it wasn't as cinematic. So we um, broke up the big blank wall with uh, some cactus, uh, some of the house plants we were carrying around, even a chopped off branch of another tree. We gaffer taped into uh, this tree you see here to get, give some shadow and break up um, the big white wall to kind of like vignette the character against his background. Towards the end of the scene, uh, the lead actor starts to kind of come under the influence of what he's been drugged with. At the end of the scene, uh, the sort of uh, bad guy's henchman shows up uh, who's drugged the coffee to kind of grab him and he starts to make a run for it, but he's too woozy. He trips on the table leg and falls. He had to kind of cobble this together from four or five different shots because we didn't want him to do any stunts. So really he's just sitting down onto the ground. 
including this crazy shot where he's sort of like sitting under the tripod and then he just sort of like drops down to his side. I hoped I would get enough stuff um, and I just in case I added a pickup of him tripping on the table so he didn't just look too useless falling over and having it all cut together looks really good. We really were fighting against the sun here. Um, the sun was kind of coming and going and we'd, we'd stop down because the sun came out and then it would go behind a cloud again and it would get too dark. This scene also made me realize how much uh, you can have all the light in the world, but if you can't get it to where you need it, it's useless, right? If you have, you know, I have four two by one uh, sort of sky panel equivalents, but I had no way to get them where we needed them, which was above uh, the talent boomed out so that you wouldn't see these stands in the shot. So we shot this thing out in about four hours, I wanna say. Uh, we went and had lunch and then we moved on to our next location. So the next location is really just a one minute scene of the main character on the phone as he leaves one location and gets picked up to go to the next, actually to the cafe where he, we've just shot. And as the screenwriter, I was always, I'm always thinking, how do I add something subliminal, something that you may not pick up on consciously, but that will affect the viewer's uh, impression of the scene um, to enhance what I'm, the effect I'm trying to give. I found these great stairs uh, in LA where they're very picturesque. They've been around since I think the 20s or 30s. And I thought it would be great for the actor to come from uh, this meeting he's just had with sort of the femme fatale and then descend down into a, like a lower level of hell um, as, as his quest becomes more and more dangerous, more fraught and more... Uh, risky. So I thought it'd be great if he, rather than just him standing on the spot or him walking down the street, we'll have him walking down these stairs as he is on the phone. Now I went and checked out the location the week before. I actually took the camera and did a, took a heap of shots. I thought this is going to work great. Uh, what I didn't really anticipate is how difficult it's going to be for a camera operator to walk backwards down this incredibly steep flight of stairs, not once or twice, but like, and not just the camera operator, I was gonna to have to do it. Whoever was reading the lines with the actor was gonna to have to do it. The actor was gonna to have to do it and the sound guy was gonna to have, to have to do it. So there were five of us who did 20 trips up and down these insanely steep stairs. And at the end of the day out, uh, at least my knees were really feeling it. Added to the logistical issues of shooting this on such a steep incline was the fact that uh, when you're shooting someone uh, on level, you tend to synchronize your steps so that it stays more or less level. When you're doing it on stairs, that it, it really does add a difficulty to that synchronization. I didn't feel comfortable using the C500 Mark II because this is our A camera and if we dropped it or scratched it or something went wrong with it, we were gonna be screwed for the rest of the film. So we went with our B camera, Sigma FP, on a travel gimbal, the Weeble S. Now the gimbal took out a lot of the, you know, small mini vibrations, but didn't take out, doesn't take out that bounce. What we really should have had was a steady cam, but steady cam backwards down those steps would have been really tough as well. Another way I thought of doing it was to have a really long lens and pull focus with the, with the actor as he walks down the stairs, uh, but that wasn't gonna work. We just didn't have a long enough lens and the focus was gonna be an absolute nightmare. So we chose to lock the focus at five feet and just have uh, Chapin, who is operating, walk down the stairs with the actor. Now, none of these challenges or problems are necessarily overwhelming, but to do it as we did so early um, in the shoot, late in the day on an uncontrolled set with other people walking through on those stairs. And there were a heap of other problems. There was a Sigma FP and an EF amount, not a PL mount. So we couldn't use the Sumire primes. So it doesn't really match um, with the rest of the footage. So we had to put a variable ND on the front of the lens. It was an older type of ND, not very expensive. And so it has a kind of color cast to it. Plus we used uh, my secondhand Rokinon 25 mil lens. Just all these things, uh, you know, were stacked against this scene and um, we ended up getting it. It took us a couple of hours, but man, I was really glad when it was over. Because there was no room for the Teradek on the Sigma FP, I was just sort of looking over Chapin's shoulder and guessing what we were getting. The Sigma FP doesn't let you play back raw footage, or at least back then it didn't. I think there's a new firmware update coming soon. But in post, I was able to further stabilize the footage um, and stop the moving around a little bit more, crop in on it so it wasn't quite so wide and even vignette the background so we didn't have that blown out highlights. There's an old saying that you start out trying to make a movie and end up trying to survive. Uh, this very much was a survival day. After we got the shots of him walking down the stairs, 
uh, we got him meeting up with his friend and jumping in the car, which all looked great back on the C500 Mark II and the Sumire Primes with the Teradek and full of focus. It's just, it's amazing how quickly you become accustomed to all of those tools. And once they're taken away, you're just sort of um, stumbling. It does remind me though that no scene makes a film and no scene breaks a film. In the greater scheme of things, this is just a small little moment and what we got will do absolutely fine for what it needs to do. It just could have looked so much better with more preparation on my end. Day four, we are shooting a chase scene in Griffith Park. So there'd be all kinds of crazy stuff happened. Let me tell you about it next time. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you then. Oh,